Let's face it, the World Wide Web is a part of our lives and getting bigger every day. The software companies and the computer manufacturers make fortunes off the back of it. But what about the man who dreamt it all up? No millions for him, he simply wanted to give it away for the benefit of others. The basis of the web is fundamentally very simple. Browsing the web is enormously complicated. Oh, that's what's in it. People. The idea that any piece of information can have an address so you can point to it is very simple. And really it all stems from that. Tim Berners-Lee, welcome to the program. The growth of the web is a lesson for all dreamers. I think it was you who said that. Are you a dreamer? Well, there was a... I suppose there was a lot, a lot of the dreaming happened beforehand, and there was a certain short period of time when I was actually, uh, I managed to find a space of time to write the code, to produce the program, and, uh, which was initially the World Wide Web. And then there was if, it was, if there was hard work, I think, for the next two years, it was persuading various communities that this was a good idea, persuading the hypertext community that had been developing hypertext applications for some time that the World Wide Web wasn't just a a horrible misconception. When people ask about the web, how is it going to avoid becoming one, giving us one big McDonald's monoculture? How are we going to avoid sinking to the lowest It hasn't, has it? I'm not yet. Well, at the same time, people are coming to me and they're saying, how, surely with the web, you only follow links from websites that you like to websites that are of the same sort of genre and have the same sort of so view on life. It becomes like television. It's not interactive. You well, just, you just but with the web, you can find amid, amid a myriad of different websites something that really matches your particular weird view of the point in life, and then you can filter your emails so that you only communicate with people who also share that weird view. You can get into a sort of cult culture, a cultural pothole, rather than this sort of the, the, the blah cultural monoblock. You have everybody in their own cultural pothole with a few crazy fanatics, and the pothole is so deep and steep they can't climb out of it, they can't understand anybody who's not in it when they bump into somebody else on the street the only form of communication that is left is shooting them. So and in between these extremes of really only communicating with a very small number of people or being completely attuned with the, with the global average and, having, and trying not to distinguish yourself in any way, there's an important principle of, of, of blending these, of actually being involved with your family as well as you know, being involved with your group and being involved with your town and being involved with your nation and being involved at the global level. Do you think in some ways that it's the creation of a monster? Because you've said that in some, in some areas it's going to get rid of jobs, it's going to upset markets, all right, it will create other jobs and create other markets. But it's, it's a profound revolution, isn't it, in, in, in terms of technology around the world, and revolutions are sometimes painful, aren't they? Yes, I suppose that there will be aspects of any change which are painful. When it comes to being a monster, I've, one of the really important things about it, uh, about the way it was designed, the, the fact that you can put hypertext links in any, any format, is that it should, you should be able to represent any sort of information on the web. The web really should not force people to express themselves in any particular way. So in, in a way, the web really is supposed to be infrastructure that gets out of the way. It's supposed to... It's supposed to make life easier. It's supposed to be a very transparent medium between the author and the reader. And so if you find that life is complex on the web, you are reading a complicated part of it. If you want to make, if you feel the web should be simple, you can go and write a very simple piece of web. You and if for some people have found you want to use the web for fraud or immoral purposes or whatever, then it's only answering to the world in which the, the world it serves, isn't it? Exactly. It's only as good as the world it serves. Yes, I, I and in many parts that's not very good, is it? The, the analogy was with paper. Can you imagine trying to invent a sort of paper which can't be used for writing untruths or can't be used for immoral purposes? It's inconceivable. It would be a horrendously complicated piece of paper. Instead, what you say is, look, the paper is used for writing whatever it is you want to express, and then uh, if you want laws, if you want to... Uh, on values, then you do those in society. You, you gave it away, didn't you, the web? You gave away the invention, in a sense. You allowed companies to come in and exploit it and make millions, and, and you didn't, in a sense. Do you, do you regret the commercialism, or was it inevitable to take the web to, to consumers? Was it inevitable? It was inevitable. It, there, 
There have been plenty of hypertext projects in the past. And there were hypertext products you could buy. But admittedly, they didn't, they didn't scale. They weren't designed exactly in the same way as the web. But if you can imagine during those first two years, there I am proposing that we should have a one common information space across the whole world. Now, if I then say, and every page you're going to pay me a couple of cents, then uh, not only would people feel that it was unreasonable as a matter of principle, a large amount of the, com of the people who were the early adopters, people in the internet community, uh, wouldn't have touched it with a barge pole. The, the, the whole competitive environment in web software is really what is driving things forward very, very rapidly. Look, if you think of the original web, which I demonstrated on a Next machine, so there was not, weren't so many people who could see it. It spread in a high-energy physics community and across a few uh, freaks on the internet. <laughs> uh, and now there is a huge amount of technology, and all the, st all the standards have advanced enormously. They've advanced enormously because it's open. There's a bit of an irony here. Because it's open, because, for example, HTML, the, the hypertext mark markup language, anybody can go and uh, write programs to, uh, which are compatible with it. Uh, there's no fee. This means that anybody can think about how it could be better. This means that there, is a p there, are, there are a huge number of possible next generations for HTML. So there's an incredible rate of development. There's an incredible rate of people bringing ideas to it. If it was the property of one company, my company or anybody else's company, that would mean that the whole world would have to wait for the research department of that company to, se to have the next good idea. So you would have been a block on the, on the research? It would have been a block. Anything which is centralized becomes a block. If you have a centralized process, it becomes a block. If you let the whole world tackle it in parallel, it goes incredibly fast. And this is are, what we've are, you seen. Happy, are you happy with the way it's developed? Very, very. 